All right, thank you so much for that kind intro. I was a little worried that Catalyst had invited me here due to my hair somewhat resembling Elvis's and how perfectly that would work in Vegas, but um, I am very excited to be here. Uh, and the clicker is not working. The thing about technology is whatever can go wrong will go wrong. It's a constant lesson. So I wanted to start this talk uh, with an iconic poem, uh, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Um, Vegas is, to me, an iconic city. And so I wanted to pivot this and, and talk speaking from this kind of iconic poem, um, given that. So everyone knows the last few lines of the poem, right? You could probably all recite it. Uh, Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Um, I think it's working now. Um, and so what's interesting about this iconic poem is that it's uh, wildly misinterpreted by most people. Um, the hallmarkification of this poem has kind of taught us the wrong lesson of, uh, that we're supposed to take away. Now, earlier in the poem, he talks about how actually the two roads are basically the same. And at the end of the poem, he says, uh, he confesses, you know, at some point I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood. So saying that actually, the, I will tell this later on and talk about how complicated it was to take the road that was harder. But in reality, we never really know at the time. Uh, and so I want to talk about how I choose my paths. And honestly, I know very little about poetry. I'm a technologist, uh, even though sometimes the technology does not work. Um, and so I, I knew very little about technology when I was a kid. I was a very geeky kid. And um, you know, so, so my initial story, there we go, uh, started with video games. I loved video games. Uh, but this made me kind of not only a nerdy kid, but also a fat kid. And <laughs> that was a problem, um, you know, and I still have that in my core. You know, I still love the video game parts. My ringtone is still Super Mario Brothers. Um, but thankfully, I've lost some of that weight. And so <laughs> how did that happen? Um, the path starting with those video games was a painful one, and it continued to get more painful. Uh, before Warby Parker made wearing really big glasses cool, in New York, being a fat Jewish kid, that was not as cool. <laughs> and so, not knowing anything else, I continued to go down the line of more video games and more technology. And so, I found that this machine would give me even more video games, and it was really exciting. Um, 386, for anybody that remembers that, yeah. Um, but I didn't have access to the video games. It wasn't like double click and bam, here one came. They were all in ARJ files, and I had to convert them into EXE. Right? So I had to learn how to actually start to initially code to learn how can I make these games much more accessible to me. And it was fun. I got to really own the machine and learn how to uh, manipulate it and use it to make it cool. Um, so um, not long after, I started really making video games. because I thought, well, the best way to have more video games is to start building them yourself. And so I would make games like Pac-Man, but I would change all the little ghosts to my friends so that I could kind of run away from them and then go back and chomp them up once I got enough of the, uh, the little pellets. And it was really amazing, but it didn't really do much for the, uh, the weight. That continued to kind of be there and be a problem. Um, and so I was looking at what university would I go to, because my goal in life was to then make video games. Uh, the path seemed pretty clear. And the only school that would let me do that at that time was Johns Hopkins, because it would let me be an engineer and also pursue liberal arts. And it was confusing to me at the time that the schools just shove you into one path and don't really give you the option of both, because I thought technology is the future. It makes sense that you would have to incorporate that to, um, to, have, uh, to figure out how to build your future life. Um, so I got to Johns Hopkins uh, September 3rd, 2001, 
from New York. And the first week of school, my hometown was suddenly under attack. My home country was suddenly under attack. And I thought, wow, my entire world has changed. The entire world has changed, not only mine. What am I going to do? And how am I going to make video games when the world is like this? And so I changed. And I chose a different path. And I went into more of a political uh, arena. And uh, so I was told, OK, you need to, uh, to go down this political arena and get an internship and work for free. And I thought, well, I speak Russian. Why would I go and, and take that path and work for free when I can work for peanuts in Russia? Peanuts sound much more interesting, but really, either path sounds kind of strange. So let's go to Russia. And so um, I ended up in Armenia, uh, a Russian-speaking country, um, though not exactly Russian. And I was working for $200 a month, which at the time was actually a king's salary. I could have all the uh, falafel and vodka that I needed to survive <laughs> in a place like Armenia. Um, however, I didn't have the politics. And with September 11th you know, fresh in my mind, I was so frustrated that the, the, my, the fellow youth in that country just were fleeing. They, were, they didn't see any future, any opportunity. They had no path other than to leave their country. And a few of us thought, well, why don't we just build a new path for people here? Um, and we created a, a youth action center called BEM, which is a platform in Armenia. So I would be standing on a BEM. Uh, and the idea was to use technology to fuel politics. Kind of a crazy idea at the time in 2003. Uh, we started something called the blog, which uh, was not actually called a blog at that point, because there were no bloggers back, back in those days. Um, but slowly, we tried to build politics and art in a center that could really create a new path for people in that country. Uh, and yet, after a year there, I hadn't finished school yet. So I had to go back to the traditional path and uh, go, went back to Hopkins and continued to kind of truck along and, uh, and finally graduated. Then there's the question of what next. Right? All these kids trying to be adults and go off into the real world. Uh, and people told me, OK, you have to either get a job or go to law school or go to any other sort of grad school. And that path, again, didn't really make sense to me. I thought, well, I see all these people around me spending enormous amounts of money to go to school. And I don't really understand the benefit of what they're learning. Are they $200,000 better than they were before they went there? And so I had the crazy idea of why not start a company with that money to create new paths and, and to really change the world. Um, so with the technology and politics that I had seen really starting to change Armenia, the, the idea was to create uh, an organization that we called Digital Democracy focused on empowering grassroots people with technology to help them have more voice to help shift their societies. And Americans thought we were crazy. Said, OK, I mean, Twitter is a few months old. Nobody had really heard of it. How is technology going to change anything? But when we got to countries and spoke with people, they really heard it loud and clear. They understood because there's so little opportunity for them to speak and to organize in the past. And we were doing a little bit of work in Haiti. And we had a team on the ground when the, the Haitian earthquake struck. And in ways that you can never predict, you know, life changes in an instant. And we were involved in some of the initial disaster response, helping with a system where you could uh, send a text message and have it appear onto a map so that emergency responders could come and save you. Now, this is a country where you know, 911 doesn't exist. But volunteers from around the world could take a technology that was actually built in Kenya and then change it so that it could work in a new context like Haiti. Um, really revolutionary. And yet then people came to us and said, you know, levels of rape are skyrocketing in this country because people are living in tent camps and there's no protection here. So can we expand this 911 system to, to work with women? Uh, and so we worked with a number of women's organizations uh, and they taught us really how to do that and we worked with them to introduce the technology. But our path 
again, was kind of a unique one because our goal was to transfer all the knowledge and leave, not to stay, which is kind of the, the normal nonprofit model. Um, and, and it was really hard to both talk to people about how technology could change the world, a new concept, as well as organize that in a new way. And so I thought, well, well what's, what could be next? Um, from all the lessons that I learned from those different paths, why not look back to my initial path, the one where there is a, a fat kid programming computer games? And if technology can really change politics, well, can technology change that kid and put me on the same path that I was on way back when? And so lately, I've been developing a new technology, which is a, a wearable device for kids called TAG. And the idea is to encourage physical activity by making physical activity more digital. So picture a game like Pac-Man, where you're it, and all your friends are running after you. But if you run enough, the devices all suddenly signal that they, they're it. And you can tag them for extra points. Right? So it's still very digital, but it's getting away from screens. And so I'm really excited about how this future of technology will continue to help us change and shift the world around us. But that's not really possible unless there's an ecosystem around that can help support us. And for me, when I'm trying to make the world a better place, it's understanding that I'm voting with my dollars, that there is a digital democracy, but there's also a financial democracy, and trying to really create um, an e ecosystem that, of good that is in my life. So you know, the, the big glasses have turned into really stylish Warby Parkers. Uh, the jewelry is full and whistles, uh, Zappos, of course, uh, Credo Mobile as my phone company, and instead of working with banks, working with a credit union. Um, and yet, the world continues to shift paths and put me on different paths. And I never know which one to take until I have to take that one. So um, less than a year ago in New York, there was a massive hurricane, Sandy. And my grandmother was right at the front of it in Brighton Beach, being uh, Russian. And uh, it was terrifying, because I didn't know if she was going to be OK. And, and I biked down as soon as I could, as soon as the debris was cleared, to see if she was OK. And I saw, because it was cold, she was heating her house with the stove. And she lives in a building with a lot of elderly folks who were also heating their houses with the stoves, causing massive amounts of carbon monoxide to come out. And so I said, oh my god, if my grandma's poisoned by carbon monoxide, I'll never know. Right? Can't there be a technology that will text me or call me if she's in danger? Um, or that will call her in Russian on her landline and tell her the carbon monoxide levels are, in danger, are at a dangerous level. You can leave the house or open the windows, call the authorities right now, and kind of walk her through the, through the process. Because currently, there's just a little device on the wall that beeps at her annoyingly, which I don't understand, and my grandma definitely don't, doesn't understand. <laughs> so I've been developing a smart smoke detector that will monitor for carbon monoxide, for smoke, as well as indoor air quality. And it's uh, really exciting. And uh, being here in Vegas, it actually uh, was kind of serendipitous. It's, uh, got covered in Fast Company and Gizmodo today, and it's really starting to move forward. And so, you know, the path is is being uh, being built as as I walk down it. So it's it's very exciting. Um, so it all goes back to, right, the the road less traveled, and and here I can stand up and I can say all these experiences were because you know I was so knowledgeable and I could say, this is some road that I didn't see, but that I knew that I had to take because it was the harder path. When in reality, it all goes back to Robert Frost, right? There were both, there were, the two paths were there. And I just took whichever one made sense at the time because it made sense at the time, not because it made more sense than the other path. Um, but we have to teach the lesson to the younger generations and to each other that there is always that other path, that there is never just one, and that we have to really claim it, own it, and move forward. So. Thank you so much.